find salvation in everyone only another pain. Someone tries to hide himself, down inside himself he prays. Someone swears his true love until the end of time. Another runs away, separate or united, healthy or insane. To be yourself is all that you can do. This is the Community Solutions Podcast. Jason Bradley, Andrew Richter, tearing it up, throwing it down. Yeah, we're back. What's going on? Well, I, I don't know. I'm just, uh, first of all, that didn't rhyme. Uh, second of all, um, <laughs> no. yeah. I guess it kind of did. Kind of. It rhymes okay. in Spanish. It doesn't um, always need to rhyme. <laughs> I suppose. Um, so now, of course, I have, I mean, I have absolutely no clue who that was. Be Yourself from Audio Slave. Audio Slave. Yeah. Uh, Chris Cornell, the great, late, late, great Chris yes, Cornell. Yes, I know and, who he uh, is. Yes. And members of Rage Against the Machine. So, uh, yeah. Good. Uh, he's He was good, I got to admit. Yeah. So. Rick Rubin produced that. He's amazing. He did uh, a lot of the the great albums from the late Johnny Cash stuff. He did uh, Johnny Cash, one of the greatest of all time. Kind of the resurgence of like the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Rick Rubin was in on that. He was in on the See, uh, I, know, I, I know who the they early are. Def Jam stuff from the the nineties. Uh, Rick Rubin was in on that. So yeah, taking me back, Jay. I know. <laughs> I know. That's what just, I'm here for. Just need the wrestle wars, the wrestling yeah. wars. We can go back to the 90s. Yeah, we could do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I kind of live there anyways. Yeah. I live a decade before, but I, I'll, the 80s I'll take, too. I'll yeah. take, I, I would, I would, uh, I'd like to take some material things and go back to the 80s, but uh, if I had a DeLorean, <laughs> I would do so. But yeah. other than that, I'm okay with, with today. Yeah, I am too. Because today is a new opportunity for us to be able to make the world a better place. And I, I'm not, I'm not being, you know, facetious about that, or I'm not being full of myself. It just, well, but, if you won't be, I will be. I think that uh, we definitely do that without question. Well, I mean, that should be everybody's aim to make the world a better place every day. And so, uh, we just do our best, right? It's all we can do. That is all we can do later today. We're going to have, I'm sure an amazing interview, uh, Council member Brad Aho, who is running for mayor in the city of Eden Prairie, is going to be with us. I'm looking forward to that. I uh, I think he'll do terrific. He's been um, – we've mentioned Eden Prairie a whole lot on this show, yeah. including one entire episode. Yeah. So I'm sure he'll give us great insight as to what's been going on down there. Um, Seems to be the only one standing against insanity down there. Pretty so. much. He's the lone sane one. But – We'll get, uh, you know, when, when uh, he gets elected mayor, who knows? He might uh, hopefully can persuade other people to join him in his quest to make uh, Eden Prairie not insane. That would be very good. Uh, speaking of insane, absolute crazy town. Now, now, now again, yeah. three guesses to the audience of where we're going with this. Yeah, there's not too many options, are there? Uh, There's a lot, but, but when there, there we, are, we say but. insane in the membrane, and I know who's saying that, but yeah. I don't know. I mean, I have no idea. But the really on this show, Cypress there's, Hill, uh, by the way. Oh, yeah. okay. okay. Uh, on this program, there's a hierarchy of uh, uh, I don't know if I want to call it insanity or whatever we would like to say about it. But there is a hierarchy of <laughs> of uh, people, I think, that we've irritated over the years. Now, does that uh, close the gap a little bit about where we're going? So we've got, we've got Brendan Banks and we've got Julia Hill. Here's the post by Julia Hill. Uh, I will edit it as, as need be for our family-friendly audience. Well, you could go back to the clothesline again. Yes, too. that's what that's – what, oh, okay. oh, Actually, I'm on the wrong one. Yeah, okay. So, uh, this is the original message. Okay. I just took Skye, which I assume is her dog, um, on her first real leash walk around the neighborhood. I wish we had some background music for this. Maybe I'll have to find some because this this story needs to be set up properly. I just took Skye on her first real leash walk around the neighborhood. It was interesting. 
She is super excited even a half hour later. Loki, who I assume is her other dog, or maybe she has many, I don't know. Loki is celebrating spring by <clears throat> humping her. Does that really have to be in there? Oh, my God. Uh, I don't uh, even remember uh, that. Uh, oh, my word. As she runs around the house doing zoomies. Now for a PSA. Parents, please teach your kids not to run full out directly at dogs. Especially not cool when they are screaming, yelling, laughing loudly, and are in a group. Even very friendly, well-adjusted dogs get freaked out by that. I reserve the right to clothesline any of your little AHs who do so and scare me and my dogs. Just FYI. Okay, thanks. Bye. She sounds delightful, Andrew. Yes, and I love the former mayor's comment. I love Miss Hill's animal public service messages. You can see this on our blog from June 7th, 2018. Yes. Um, but uh, clotheslining kids. Let me tell you something. I wonder what would happen to Miss Hill if she clotheslined the wrong kid. I don't know. Uh, if she clotheslined any kid. Yeah, I, that would be that... assault first and foremost. Yes, it would. So uh, you have a council candidate who's at now. Now, Miss Hill has since scrubbed this. Yes. Off her Facebook page. We were able to snap because this. She's embarrassed about it. It's well, terrible. It's terrible to say. It's terrible she, behavior. She should be. I'm sure the former mayor isn't embarrassed. Oh, no. No, she you doubles shame, down. You on couldn't this. shame her no matter what. <clears throat> um, so that was an interesting thing. I mean, I advocating violence against children is not a great platform to get elected by. Yeah, I, don't, I, I think, don't think. I don't think it's on her website. I mean, I unless think. it's abortion. Then, oh, whoops. Sorry. Uh, okay. Jay, knock uh, it off. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll behave. <laughs> I will behave. This is a nonpartisan show, folks. It is. We try. <laughs> we try. Um, I saved another doozy here. This is from her Facebook page in 2017. I saw that. This is also up on the blog. So it is. go out there and uh, this look, is, take a look. There's a lot in this blog post because uh, I have to have fun with this or I can't. Do you want me to read this in my interpretive storytelling voice again? or? or? Yeah, why not? Okay. We don't have the music, but I can hum. That's it. Well, I don't know if we need that. Maybe right, I, I won't. Maybe I'll find something. October 16th on the Community Solutions <clears throat> blog that this is from, if you want to read the whole thing. To the crystal police officer who felt it beneath him to help us catch my neighbor's dog or even to call in a report. You are an embarrassment to that uniform. Anyone who shows such a remarkable lack of character and compassion is not fit to serve the citizens of this community. All right. I'm going to stop you right there. All right. Look, I've had my differences with the police before yeah. on some things. I would never, ever in a million years use that kind of language to speak of an officer. Yeah. You don't know what an officer is doing. You don't know what they've been told. Um, and to disagree with somebody called them unfit for office is conduct unbecoming of somebody running for office. Maybe he wasn't fit to serve because he was, like, you know, overweight. He, no, I don't, I, think, I don't that's think that's what, what she meant. It's, it's, it's just crazy. Okay. <clears throat> Back into my storytelling voice here. I'm sure questioning the two hot Swedish co-eds. What is it with her and her language? I, <laughs> and I'm I don't reading know. it like this. Okay. <clears throat> I, I am sure questioning the hot, two hot Swedish co-eds who may or may not have had a permit to sell stuff door-to-door, -door, was more fun. But those same young women were helping us catch the dog. You could have questioned them after Wally was caught. Now, Wally, this is a third dog name. Mm. I, I would like to know if she... Wally Cleaver? I would like to know if she has a... a private a kennel license? Private kennel license to have three dogs in the city of Crystal because... And they were talking about getting rid of that. I don't know they haven't yet, though. Yeah, so she, okay. either she has one or she's breaking the law. I would like to know. Somebody, please. Well, wait a minute. This says, help us catch a neighbor's dog at the beginning. Oh, neighbor's? So. Oh, it was a neighbor's. Okay. W Wally Never mind. Next All right. It was her neighbor's dog. Still important. Okay. We're all about the facts here, Community Solutions. Uh, yeah, so absolutely. Got to get it right. All right. <clears throat> back back to the story. Instead, you made it clear that you had absolute zero interest or concern for a dog's life and refused to offer even 
a smidgen of assistance. Okay, I'm going to stop you there. I All want right. to read this last sentence. Yeah. And even okay, you don't start a you don't start a sentence with and, <laughs> and even refused us their assistance. In Assu- help, assistance in helping says. O catch the dog. In helping O so. catch the dog. Yeah, <laughs> As- assistance. But that spell check's broken. <laughs> well, maybe that's the other reason Ms. Bowman likes her so much. They kind of uh, share that. Maybe <clears throat> I realize that you have a certain amount of discretion, but somehow cannot believe that a piece of paper could ever trump a life of someone's pet. Perhaps you would care to explain what fed into our decision. I have my suspicions, of course, but would nonetheless like your explanation. Tell me, City of Crystal Police Department, how can your department possibly defend the behavior of this officer? Well, and I would say you have your suspicions. What's that supposed to mean? Was the officer hitting on these women or something? Was that what was going on? Is that what they're being accused of doing? Uh, I don't know. Because later, he, the officer is a, called a young idiot with the buzz cut. Yeah, I I don't know. Is that about the officer? Is that about somebody that owns a different dog? Either way, even if it's not the officer, you're talking about someone who's a potential constituent calling them a young idiot with a buzz cut. Well, I mean, either way, it's she's delightful. What if the police officer called a citizen that? Would that be all right with Julia Hill? Well, no, not if a police officer. Yeah, folks, working anymore because there's just a deluge. She has. um, I find. So I, she can block every one of them, I guess, from from seeing what she puts out there. But she doesn't hold back. Um, no. Uh, this is from, I don't recall the date here. But uh, there's a picture the city of Crystal put out of uh, Councilman Jeff Kolb um, swearing in a police officer. And uh, Miss Bowman uses that as uh, calling Mr. Kolb a photo op. For a next run for public office, even though Mr. Kolb's not running for anything again. And he's doing his job. Right. Isn't the mayor pro temp supposed to do that? Yeah. Uh, Renee swore in police. I remember them. I was at some yeah. of the meetings. I know. So I don't know if that's uh, – and, and here is maybe the dumbest line I've ever heard somebody – well, I don't know if that's uh, – um, the city has – he has left the city cash poor with no money to maintain our parks, roads, and utilities. Let me let me educate you, Miss Bowman, on what's going on. I don't know if you could pull your head out of the sand for for that long or drop your your basket of hate, um, <coughs> ignorance, which I am just. Uh, you never go far enough in that. Cash strapped with utility. Um, who just paid cash for a public works building? That'd, That'd be the be city of Crystal. City so Crystal. how are we cash yeah. strapped if we paid for an entire building without borrowing? Well, because we spent everything that we're ever going to make. Look at Becker <laughs> Park and Welcome Park. Yeah. They're being redone under construction. So why? what are you talking about? We don't have money to take care of our parks. What are we doing to them right now? Yeah. And I- I'm sorry, um, roads? We have all the phase plans done, and we are not assessing for the mill and overlay project. Yes. Yeah. So what on earth? Is she talking about? I don't know. This is not only, this is beyond being cuckoo. (laughs) Well, then she goes on to say they have a five-year budget on the table full of empty promises because they got no money, but they sure got their eye on running for more political office. Um, Actually, there's a two-year budget on the table. Yeah. Um, I don't know where she got the number five from. Well, a, a five looks like a upside down two. Well, I mean, and they could be doing of. they could be doing some long term planning with other stuff, but it's not in the budget. Yeah, uh, the long term planning is is around uh, their fund balances, which is which do go out. You do go out with those because you may say, okay, in ten years we need a new this, so now yeah. we've got to put money aside, and we're going to put X next year, and hopefully Y the year after that, Z the year after that. Mm-hmm. There could be something like that. I, I guess the former mayor doesn't know the difference. Right. Which, okay, whatever. And then because they're not endorsed by the DFL, they're nonpartisan, she goes on to call them Republicans with three Ks in the middle, like 
the Ku Klux Klan, and and then a democratic creation. Yeah, and exactly, the Democrats created that, I guess. Uh, and then accuses them that this is just what they do across the country. Like there's some big movement by Republicans and Libertarians to take over city councils across the country and, Boy, ruin, would, and ruin cities. I would I, love it if there was a, a Republican or Libertarian movement to do that. We're trying to create one. <laughs> but I can tell you most councils are not run by Republicans. Yeah. I, I find the next section more disturbing. I really find this. Seldom in Western civilization have I seen someone so ignorant, that part. <laughs> oh, no, no, not the part I wrote. Uh, 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 the next, the... Um, I enjoyed that sentence. <laughs> I, I did. Uh, I mean, it was Western civilization. Thank you, Bill Walton, for the yeah. reference. Um, what she says about Brandon Banks next, yeah. I find... Um, First off, extremely racist. Yeah, Brendan is running um, for Ward Two for Ward Two against Julia. Um, and and this, is, this is bad. I mean, this is really bad. And I, um, she talks about signs being out, and apparently there's a Brendan Banks sign where there is a Donald Trump sign. Of course, this is nonpartisan, right? Um, believe it or not, when I ran for office, I had a few. Uh, Non Republican signs near mine. Yeah, they were just people who disagreed with, with me on a national level and agreed with me on a local level. Yeah, uh, it does Which happen. Which is the way it should work. It does happen. They were nonpartisan races. Yeah. She accuses him basically of being a corrupt ex cop, and uh, she says, "Now, Mr. Banks is a black guy." Yeah. Okay. It's not about the color of skin, rather the content of his character. Uh, and, and this is I, after she called him a Republican with three Ks. With again. three Ks. He references the Ku Klux Klan talking about this who, man. Who killed African Americans right. in this country. And you think Brandon Banks is a supporter of the KKK? <laughs> I, man, I'm, I'm just saying, let me put it this yeah. way. If, if I accused one of her friends of something like this. I can't even fathom to see her reaction to it. Yeah. I wouldn't do that. But, I mean, I am – I'm loathe on the radio to say what I really think here. Okay. Because this is it's a family show. That's probably good. beyond low. <laughs> um, accuses of him being – makes fun of where he lives. It's funny. Yeah, funny. I thought Democrats were the, were the, the champions of the downtrodden and – Everybody has a voice, right? And everybody is welcome, and everybody can serve. And I guess if uh, if Mr. Banks isn't on your plantation there, Miss Bowman, I guess he's not welcome. Yeah. And how many of your candidates are minorities? Yeah, zero. So while you bluster about it, you don't do a damn thing. You're all talk. You're all whining. You're a crab ass. You're a victim. You're every little thing that you complain about. Look yourself in the mirror, and that's you. How think you I'm really done? Feel. Think I'm done? No, I'm no, not done. No. And I do want to congratulate Julia Hill. She now has three yard signs out in Crystal. Her house, Renee's house, and some house on Hampshire. <laughs> I've been looking. <laughs> who who is a supporter of Renee, by the way? Yeah, and yeah. I mean, boy, I'll tell you what. A Renee endorsement? Let me tell you something. If Renee endorsed me as a jerk. I wouldn't take it. <laughs> okay, I mean it. It. She. I. I mentioned this in the blog. She's got a worse batting average than Bob Euchre, and it's true. <laughs> I mean, if you stand yeah. a chance, Miss Hill, and I'm being your advisor here, and I know you're not smart enough to listen. This to is me. what we do. I mean, right, we, yeah, we advise is, people. Right. I mean, all over the state. With our winning percentage, I'd put that up against anybody's. Yeah. Um. You see this woman coming at you, Miss Bowman? Run. Run as far as you can. Run like me at a pizza buffet. Run far, okay? Because <laughs> attaching yourself, and I don't know what it is about people uh, who think, you know, doing the same thing over and over again. I mean, it's always called the definition of insanity. Yes. But this is, um, I, I don't know, what, what is to be, what is to be gained by attaching yourself to the former mayor? A losing record. Yeah, I guess. 
I guess you're not too serious. And, you know, I don't... Before we get into the attacks on me personally, yeah, I, which, again, that's part of politics. I've been, fine. I've been getting attacked for years. You have to learn how to take that. I... Again, I'm struggling with how to hold back my my comments here. Um, I don't mind being criticized. I don't mind people who disagree with me. Um, I've got family members who don't agree with me. I've got uh, my mother in law who doesn't agree with me. Uh, I don't love them any less. I don't. I, I don't. I, I put family and friends ahead of that stuff. Okay, love them all. Um, I don't like being accused of things I've never done. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that that that's tough. <laughs> um, it it is just kind of uh, for Renee Bowman to call anybody a bigger name caller than her. I, I'm trying to think of an equivalent that that would equal. Hmm. I mean, it would kind of like be being having a, a hurricane on Lake Superior. I mean, it's so <laughs> remote. It's so. I, I'm just amazed of how un, unself aware someone can be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you want to disagree with me? Fine. You want to call me an a hole? I can live with that. Okay. I've never called anybody a libtard. I have never used that word. No. And if she, if I had, she'd show it, and she doesn't do that. Um, I'm the biggest name caller in our district. I don't live in our district. I can no, have no. You're, you're not the biggest you're the bestest oh the bestest the bestest that's right the bestest yes um i can have an opinion i don't live in washington dc but i can have an opinion on what's going on there can't i yeah i don't live in crystal anymore but i have friends there i can help anybody who i want and i will continue to do it and i will drive you as insane as human i think she loves me i think that's the real truth could be i mean i kind of you know love and hate there's not a big difference there right you know you you got people you got people who get divorced and just it's it's the most hated thing heated thing on earth I guarantee you one time they were really in love because that's where all the hate comes from mm. so um and i gotta say something too i i um have never been compared to alex jones before well i actually um she thinks I'm, what, the Alex Jones of this area? Well, I mean, she has called us conspiracy theorists in the past. She warns me that my days are numbered. What, what does that mean? Does that, I mean, I know that it's a story about Twitter permanently banning Alex Jones. Yeah, stifling free speech. Is, but she's saying your days are numbered. Does that mean your physical days are numbered? Or I could take that as a threat. Or you're that? getting banned off of social media. I, uh well, apparently she supports that. Yeah, apparently she does. You I, could I wonder, take it as a threat. I could. My days are numbered. I mean, if you said that to somebody, yeah. hey, pal, your days are numbered. You mm -hmm. could take that as a threat. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I think you could. But apparently um, she does not support free speech. I mean, again, there's something in this country called the First Amendment where you can't ban speech you don't like. You can't shut up people you disagree with. That's right. one of the fundamental things this country was founded on. And whatever you think of Mr. Jones, and quite frankly, I, I don't – I know who he is, but I, I, I really don't listen to him. I've seen one or two of his things he's put out, but mm -hmm. I don't know where to listen to him or <laughs> I really don't know. So um, I wouldn't – but I support his – freedom to say what he wants and his his website should not be shut down there's no way he should be banned from anything that is totally not fair uh to do that because you don't like what he puts out mm -hmm. um so uh, to me it's and i wouldn't support that for anybody on the left either right i wouldn't try to shut them up i would never do something like that so i don't um but you know the truth is and i'll just conclude it with this and I'll say this directly to you, Miss Bowman. My days are not numbered. You're the dinosaur around here. Okay? You're the elephant in the room, not me. What I'm doing is growing. What we're doing is getting bigger. Yeah. 
And the truth is, you hate it, you can't handle it, you don't know what to do about it. And the only thing you can do is go lash out at people like me and whine and complain and play the victim. And that's all you can do. And, you know, th- there's, there's a, a thing about, about, you know, when somebody loses or somebody, um, you know, uh, loses a race and, and how, they, how you conduct yourself in defeat says so much about your character. It does. I mean, not how th- not how you act when things are good. It's how you act when the rubber hits the road. And I'm going to I'm going to brag about myself. When I got beaten, Crystal, I Jim Adams and I called each other. I can say this story now. Mm-hmm. Um, I helped him in any way I could. Uh, it was he was gracious to me. I thought I was gracious to him. I was never an ill word. There was never a bad feeling. And we got together and ousted you, Miss Bowman. <laughs> And Jim won with class. I lost, I thought, with class. And you have a ton of class. It's just all low. <laughs> you know, I mean, when she left office, she went on a tirade at the people. We know who that was directed at. Yeah. You and me in particular. Yep. Um, we were deluged with it in 2014 and in 2016. And we've beaten you every time. We're going to beat you again. Yeah. At the polls. That's right. Beating at the polls. <laughs> Big difference. Yes. Oh. My days are not numbered. No. <laughs> wow. But I'm having fun yeah. reading this stuff. Yeah. It's amazing how crazy I drive people. Yeah. I, I don't think uh, you guys should be scrubbing your social media accounts. This is fun. No. This is great. That that kind of went a while, but I think it was a story worth telling. It was, you know, and and I think, uh, you know, we're just going to keep the fun going. Um, <laughs> we we got Brad Aho coming up next. Yeah, and, sorry, Brad, take no, all your time. That's all right. I, oh, tell you what, in in the show notes here, I will I will mark where his interview starts, so that if if you don't find that last bit entertaining, you can <laughs> you can get exactly to uh, where. Uh, Councilman Aho picks up. So, yeah, so it'll uh, be a great interview. Absolutely. So we'll be right back with that. Don't you go anywhere. Hey, this is Jason Bradley from the Community Solutions Podcast. I just want to take a moment and talk to you because we are neck deep in election season and people are getting their campaigns into full swing. And we wouldn't have it any other way than having you out there in the community meeting your neighbors and growing Team 20K. You know what, though? Some of you out there I know could use a little extra bump, whether that's some strategy, whether that's learning how to read a comprehensive annual financial report, whether that is understanding your city's comprehensive plan. We're here for you. So get a hold of us, and we would love to sit down for a consulting session with you. Nobody else in Minnesota does this at the local level. All you got to do is reach out to us at commsolutionsmn at gmail.com. That is commsolutionsmn at gmail.com, and we will sure make your campaign competitive. All right, enough of my yapping, and back to the show. Welcome back, and as promised, we have Brad Aho here from the city of Eden Prairie running for mayor. Welcome, Brad. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, you currently sit on the Eden Prairie Council, and you're looking for the mayor seat. Uh, why don't you start off just telling us a little bit about you and then uh, maybe a little bit about Eden Prairie? Sure. Well, thanks for having me. I'm honored to be here, and uh, this will be fun. So my name is Brad Aho. Aho, for those of who don't know, is a Finnish name. And so I'm a second-generation immigrant. My dad's parents both immigrated from Finland, and uh, so I'm second-generation Finnish. So I do understand immigration issues. But I am not Hawaiian and I'm not Asian, <laughs> as a lot of people think. Yeah. yeah, before meeting you, I won't say what I thought you looked like. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, no. Finland, you know, I've been through there. Really? Yeah, really? it's up by Duluth. Finland? Uh, no. Oh, that's... oh, no, that's not it? Okay. <laughs> no, no, it's uh, a Scandahuvian country. <laughs> it, yes, it is. Uh, hey. Uh, no, I, I figured that it was a, a Finnish name being from Duluth. I, I knew ma- many Finns. So well, good. Being Swede myself. It, yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, just a little bit about me. Um, I 
I grew up in Michigan, moved to Minnesota my senior year in high school, and uh, I, I have a degree in double, double E, electrical engineering, from the University of Minnesota, and uh, I am a small business owner, and I am also currently chief technology officer at a company in Egan. So I have, really have a technology background. I've worked a lot in the healthcare field in IT, and that's what we're presently doing at the company in, in Egan. They bought my my, one of my companies, and I went to work for them about 10 years ago. Wow, that's great. Congratulations. Thanks. It's, yeah. it's really exciting. I, I enjoy working in the healthcare IT field, and we work with, uh, in the dental market specifically, dentists and dentists and oral yeah. surgeons. Wow. Well, I'll tell you what, I kind of got a bad tooth. So maybe you can fit me you, in. You want him to look at it? No. I, I got players in the car. <laughs> <laughs> Only going to the dentist if my wife makes me. <laughs> oh. But I've been married for 38 years uh, to the same same woman. <laughs> we have, we have uh, three adult children, and now we have two, uh, two grandchildren. So it's a lot of fun. I'm enjoying that. And uh, we lived in Eden Prairie a long time. Lived in Eden Prairie almost 30 years now. And so I've really gotten to know the community, and I and I love the city of Eden Prairie, and the city has been great to us as a family, and and I just really got into politics because I wanted to give back to the community, and uh, a lot of our friends said there was an open seat in 2004. One of the council members was retiring, and they said, "Why don't you run for that seat?" And I said, "Well, it's a good time for me to give back. I think I will do that." And nine people ran for two seats, one incumbent, and I was fortunate enough to win. Uh, with the incumbent and uh, and been serving ever since. So I've been on the council almost 14 years now, and really enjoyed it. Wow, that's great. Yeah, those uh, at large races can be kind of cumbersome, but I mean, for for you it works out good because now you're running an at large race again. I mean, it's it's kind of same same. It it is exactly the same, and you know we really have to. I think I like at large because it really forces you to be aware of all the issues in the in the entire city and not just a little pocket. And so you, when you're making decisions at the local level, I think it's important to make decisions that are best for the entire city and not just be focused on one smaller area subsection of the city. So I think it's really a good good way to go. Well, good. Um, so. You've been doing this a while. Uh, our uh, in- introduction to you was when we listened to the Eden Prairie City Council meeting when you were looking at putting in, not you personally, but your council was looking at putting in a moratorium on new firearms dealers in the city. Uh, you were the only one that stood against that in what was a four to one decision. Uh, they tried to stick the first and second readings of that ordinance into one fell sweep, which uh, that's. An interesting way to go about things. That's uh, what we call slamming it in. <laughs> yes, yes, it they was. It must not be a charter city. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We are a statute plan B city. Uh, yes. City. Actually, you know, like we talked about the city we're sitting in, St. Louis Park. Yes. Remember they put the, the one of their things in their consent agenda. Remember that? Yes. And so that was... The first Tobacco 21. Right, that yeah, was that was basically right a in. violation of their charter. That's why I yeah. asked if they... Uh. Terrible. Anyway, another yeah, okay. enough. I don't. I don't yeah. mean to bring up St. Louis Park and damper everything. Yeah. Here, <laughs> well, so you can go back in in our uh, archives and listen to that and, and what we had to think about that. But I, I'd like to ask you, Brad, just uh, to kind of fill us in on what it was like being the one person standing in the middle of. I don't know what that was. It was. It sounded like absolute lunacy uh, from the four other members on your council. Yeah, so let me give you a a little bit of history here. So the meeting prior to that meeting, um, I found out that there was a resolution coming because the meeting prior to that, uh, we were talking, we were discussing a Shields store that's coming in to replace the uh, the Sears store that 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 closed at the Eden Prairie Mall. And so this Shields store is going to be a phenomenal store. We're really excited about it. But there was a number of residents that that expressed concern because, as you probably know, if you're familiar with Shields, they do sell firearms. And so they came, and this small group of residents came to the city council meeting, and they said. You know, we are so opposed to them being able to sell firearms. How can you allow that? Because, you know, firearms next to a mall is so dangerous. And so, um, so, so that that's when some of our members on our council, the, the my opponent actually said, well, 
we've got to do something. This is, and I said, uh-oh, you know, here it comes. I said, whenever a politician says we've got to do something, that's when you really have to look out and beware. Because we are all uh, apprised of, of our rights as a city and what we can do, what, what our statute powers are, and what regulatory authority we have uh, in regard to firearms. And that is that we have no right to regulate the sale of firearms, ammunition, or accessories. And so um, this council, my this council member, the other council member, my opponent said, "Well, we got to do something." So he asked staff to prepare a resolution that would ask all of the gun sellers in Eden Prairie to voluntarily not sell "quote unquote" assault weapons, not not sell high capacity magazines, and not sell to any long guns to anyone under the age of twenty one. Hmm. So they're asking themselves to get rid of, like, what, a big percentage of their business, first and yeah. foremost. Right. So I, I thought, oh, that's really interesting. So I went and talked to each one of our, our gun retailers. I went to Arns and Arms as one of the stores. I went and talked to the ownership there, to Dan and Kate Arnzen. I went to Gander Outdoors, another store that sells firearms. And I talked to Tom Shields of, of the Shields store. And said what you know what are your thoughts on this resolution what you know what do you think you'll do will you comply with this and they all said to me every one of them said look if we raise the age and don't sell firearms to anyone that's between 18 and 21 we will be sued we'll we'll be welcoming a lawsuit we cannot do that and get by the way uh these sporting arms not not what I would call assault rifles, are very popular. People love them for target shooting, for competition. A lot mm-hmm. of people use them for hunting. And that's a big part of our business. We're not going to not sell those. Assault rifles. I wonder if people who, who want to ban those could could pick out. And you know what an assault no, rifle is to them? Any gun that looks scary. Right. And, and a lot of them, I mean, there have been, you know, I, I've seen things where somebody goes out on the street, shows them a picture of, of, of a gun, and it's like a scary-looking BB gun, and they say that's that's an assault rifle. You well, know? right. It's, but, I mean, your average handgun today is a semi-automatic. Absolutely. You don't eject a cartridge. So Most hunting just... rifles are, are yeah. semi-automatic. You yeah. Know, you know, older style uh, rifles are, are semi-automatic. And so – and they're they're much higher caliber, you know, much more powerful. I mean, a, an AR-style weapon is typically a two twenty three, and they're not much more powerful than a twenty two rifle. I mean, a little bit more powerful, but same – roughly the same caliber, very small, uh, small bullet. Yeah, Absolutely. So anyway, so I, I, I talked to all the uh, the gun dealers, and I said, you know, what are your thoughts on this? I said, this is coming to the city with a, as, a, as a resolution. And so I have to tell you, our email inboxes as a council were flooded with people that were upset about, about <laughs> this and, and, you know, vehemently opposed to it. And, you know, no surprise. And so then uh, when it came to that vote uh, at the council, when the resolution was brought forward to the meeting, uh, we had the council chambers were absolutely packed and full of people. And a lot of people spoke before the meeting at the open podium section, you know, uh, expressing their views and concerns with what was what was taking place. We might have contributed to that a little bit. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I passed it on to a friend or two. I do. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so that so I, the mayor and uh, and my opponent, I could see them up at the council uh, at the behind the dais there, and they started uh, they started whispering back and forth between themselves, and they didn't call for a vote on the resolution. They could see that the political wind was against them, and they decided not to bring it forward to a vote. So I thought. No, no. Let me ask a question about a resolution. Uh, I mean, is that the that's not the same as changing the city code or something like that? I mean, they passed a resolution wanting, or they wanted a resolution asking businesses not to do something, basically. Right. It's a it's it's basically it's, symbolic. It's a symbolic feel good, uh, you know, kind of a kind of a step, saying that well, we know we don't have any authority to make any changes, any ordinances that would require the the gun sellers to comply with this. So we're going to pass this resolution that will, you know, 
we can use it to say to our, our friends on the left that, oh, you know, we did something about this, when really, in reality, it would do nothing because no one would have complied with it. Right. I love how you can't send, send, sell a gun to, next to a mall as opposed to another business or, a, you know, a frozen tundra mm-hmm. or whatever. I mean, um, is there a correlation between gun sales at, next to a mall and anything like that? No, no, I, I doubt it. <clears throat> you know, and especially, I mean, we're not talking. It, it wasn't like at the Eden. Was it at the Eden Prairie Mall where it? Okay. It is at the Eden Prairie Center is where Shields is moving in. But okay. So here's what we did. Prior to that meeting, uh, a number, I don't know exactly when it was, but when Shields was coming to the city council to get approval of the planned unit development, the PUD agreement, uh, one of the things we did talk to them about was what are your policies and procedures going to be for gun sales? Because just prior to them coming to the council meeting, there was, I don't know if you heard about it, but there was a big scare and a shutdown at the Eden Prairie Center where someone um, someone uh, brought a, a, a weapon in, in a, in a case, into the mall because there was a small concept shield store within the mall. And he knew that shield stores sell firearms. So he was bringing his firearm in there to get some work done on it, to get a repair done. So he walked into the mall with this, this firearm in a case. And someone saw him, and they raised the uh, you know the alerts, and they shut the mall down, and it was it was this huge huge deal. So it was very important for us to know, as city council members, as the city leadership, how was their sales going to be handled at the store? And so we went through in great detail with Shields how they were going to do it. They were going to, if someone purchased a firearm and in the store, basically an employee would escort that person, the the buyer to the door, then after they went outside, they would give the firearm to the, to the new owner. Uh, it would be in a case or in a, you know, locked up and then they would take it straight outside to their vehicle. It was not going through any part of the mall. It was going from the store out to their vehicle. Gee, DNA isn't even handled that securely. (laughs) (laughs) And, and, and the other thing we said, you know, we asked, we talked to them was about, you know, what are your policies about selling firearms? Because that, you know, there's, there's a lot of laws, as you probably are aware, a lot of laws, federal regulations regarding the sale of firearms. Minnesota has like five pages of, of regulations on who can purchase a firearm, who can own a firearm, who can, you know, mm-hmm. own, have a firearm, all those different things. But we said, you know, what are your policies going to be when you're selling? And so they said, well, look. We have a strict policy that if someone, ha- they have to, A, be qualified to purchase it. So if there's a permit required, they have to show all the paperwork, all the pertinent information. But if the salesperson has any inkling that there's just something wrong about this individual and they choose not to sell it to the person, even though they're fully qualified, we will compensate that salesperson just the same as if they would have made a sale. So basically what they were telling us was that they don't want to sell to anyone that shouldn't get one, and they don't want their their salespeople to be incentivized only by the financials. And so right. they want their salespeople to be thinking and to be watching and to be, you know, vigilant. Wow, that, that's good. You know, I... See, you leave it in the hands of... of uh... The private sector, and look what happens. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, they're a, they're a very responsible company, and and we talked to and I talked to the other gun sellers, and they they felt the same way. They had the same policies in their stores, and so, you know, I feel that the the private sector is doing a great job. Obviously, the last thing that one of those stores would want to have happen is have someone purchase a weapon from their store and go out go out and commit some kind of crime with it. Absolutely. I, I mean, mean, that would be horrible. It's terrible for business. Absolutely. <laughs> among among other things. Right. Right. I mean, just, you know, if you look at it just from a self-interest point of view, though, it, it would be terrible for their store, for their financial health to have well, somebody go out and shoot somebody well, and with remem- one of their guns. And remember, absolutely, I mean, they can lose their licenses. They can get yeah. sued. There's a if you're if you're a if you're a, you know, a corporation and you've got a fiduciary responsibility, then there's licensing and there's lawsuits and all that that are going to come with that. Right. 
So, but but that didn't stop the people that that were on your council with you, <laughs> right? So the very <laughs> good point. So the very the very next meeting, I thought, okay, well, you know, you can't we, turn away from a city council for one meeting. <laughs> no, how many times have we said this? No, you got to be constantly vigilant. So the very next meeting, I'm looking through our packet as it's you know as we're studying it, and I'm thinking, I go, oh, great. So. What we had the very next meeting is that a, there was a proposed moratorium on three new businesses. Yep. <laughs> the, now, I thought it was very interesting the way they mixed the businesses together. Yeah, so did we. We, we thought that was very curious. So it was adult use establishments, right. basically porn shops. Mm-hmm. It was pawn shops. So porn <laughs> shops, pawn shops, and, and firearm dealers. And so I said... Wait a minute. Reminds me of a movie I watched in college. <laughs> oh, boy. We won't get into that, yeah, I hope. No. <laughs> so the three were lumped together. How so? What was the purpose of it? Just to refresh the audience. So right. here's here's my thought is that, you know, they said, when I say they, I mean the other council members basically said that um, we don't have regulations or zoning ordinances on any of these businesses. So let's put them all together and then pass them, you know, all at one time. Put this moratorium on it for one year so that we can study it, determine if we need to have some kind of zoning regulations on where these these businesses can be located. But what what really I think was happening there was that they were lumping gun stores in with the others because they thought if we do that, then no one will want to vote against that because who would be against having some moratorium and, and zoning ordinances on pawn shops and porn shops? So they thought, oh, if we just lump the gun dealers in with that, we'll, we'll pass it all as one fell swoop and uh, you know everything is great. They didn't fool us. No, no. I, and we, t- we talked about it back on episode 69, if 69. people want to check that out, just like Jared Allen. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> All right. So anyway, so it, it, your opponent was pretty instrumental in, in pushing this forward, along with Nancy Tyra Lukens, the mayor. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. They, they so now were... what, what was the resolution of it? Did that pass? Well, so here's what, here, so here's what happened. So I said, I think that we ought to separate – the the gun store uh, retailers from the other two uses because I think it is highly offensive to put those businesses and the people that are customers of those businesses in with the other uses because I think... Plus, those firearm places sell more than guns. Yeah. Right. Don't they? They sell a lot of... A lot of these sporting places sell... 2,000 things. Look at Shields. I mean, yeah. they, they have, I mean, that's going to be a 250,000 square foot store with a 60 foot high Ferris wheel, a 60,000 gallon aquarium. They sell bikes and kayaks and everything. Same with Gander Outdoors. Gander Outdoors is a fabulous yeah. store. They sell a lot of sporting goods, uh, a lot of sporting, uh, you know, uh, sports equipment. A great store. So why are you. Why are you uh, categorizing them with these other stores? And and this is a very legitimate business. And so I talked, I went to each of the stores again, and I said, here's here's the moratorium, the potential. Now, this is not a resolution. This is an ordinance. So ordinance means that it's it's law and that it's city code and yep. you have to follow it under penalty of law. So I said, you know, our, what do you think about that? So obviously every one of now, them was... Now, Brad, hold on. So the moratorium would do what exactly? Just yeah, so let people me, understand what that means. Sure. That's a, that's a good point. Thanks for pointing that out. So a moratorium means that no new store could be come into Eden Prairie and would pass through the through the process. It just it would would not even we would not even take take an application for a new store. It for just, one year for for that. up to one year, uh, or until or and it could be extended or until the time that uh, the city staff and the council could study the the effects of those businesses on the community and make a decision on what they wanted to do for zoning, which could be the year twenty seventy eight. If it can be extended, it can be extended forever, can't it be? Uh, I don't. I don't know that there's any limit on how long it could be extended. Huh. So I said, "Look, why why do we need a moratorium on gun sales? We have had gun sales in our city for decades. 
We've had the study. The study is, is conclusive. There have been no issues as a result of having gun sellers in our community. There's been no, no shootings as a result of it, no incidents with uh, lower property values. There's been no issues. It's been, a, it's been a good thing. These guys are legitimate business owners. They do a great job. They service a lot of customers. And why are we, why are we doing this to them? Because nobody wants it near a school. <laughs> Isn't that what they said? Well, yeah, but there there is already yeah. there is already federal regulations that exactly. say you cannot be within a thousand feet of a school with the yeah. firearm unless the firearm is you know locked in a case and there's all kinds of yeah. stipulations. Bolted down to the back of your right. van or something. Uh, right, like that. right, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what what ended up happening? Though? So so here's what took place. So it it. It, I said, let's separate it. At the council meeting, I said, let's separate them. And I, I convinced a couple other of the council members, and my opponent was actually one that, uh, to my surprise, agreed to separate it from the, from the other two uses. And by the way, as we alluded to earlier, this was a vote of first and second reading of the ordinance. So you can have first and second reading of, a, of an ordinance or a proposed ordinance in one meeting to kind of slam it through, so to, so to speak, as I would say. But it has to be unanimous by everyone at the council meeting. All the council members have to vote unanimously on it. So they could see that it wasn't going to be unanimous because I was not going to vote for it. And so they didn't want to keep it in with, with the other two because they knew the whole thing would get voted down because I wasn't going to support it. So they agreed to separate the firearms out of it and then we passed the moratorium, temporary moratorium on the other two businesses. And then one of the other council members said, well, we can't go through this meeting without bringing the firearms uh, moratorium up. So it came to a, <laughs> like I said. Yeah. You got something I can poison myself with here? <laughs> <laughs> we got to do something, they yeah. said. We got to do something. And so... So it it came to a vote, and to my utter amazement, I voted against it. I knew that was going to happen, but my opponent voted against it, against the moratorium. And the, I almost fell out of my chair up at, the, <laughs> up at the podium there because I think really what happened is that he could see that there was a lot of political wind against against this moratorium and he could see all the people that were in the council chambers he heard all the got all the emails got all the voicemails he knew what was going on so he voted against it so that but it it passed three to two okay because all all five of us were there so when you pass the first reading of a ordinance it has to pass a second reading so it came to the council the next council meeting for a vote again my opponent will happen to be missed that meeting. Hmm. hmm. <laughs> Just happened to. Just happened to not be there. <laughs> but he, he called his rich uncle and said, "Would you die in two weeks, and I, so I don't have to be here?" No, I'm <laughs> he's missed it too. You know, he's missed a fair number of meetings, and and a lot of them have been work related. So I don't know, you know, if it was a truly legitimate work-related issue that he missed the meeting for or not. And I'll just say on that note, in the 14 years that I've been on the council, I've missed two council meetings. One, because I was getting a stem cell transplant down at Mayo Clinic. The second one was because I was with my daughter who had just had a baby in Georgia. Where's your commitment? <laughs> <laughs> But you know that's the yeah. thing is I, I make it part I make it a priority I make it part of my you know part of my life I work around the meeting so that mm -hmm. I'm there because I think it's important when you sign up for something like this that you are committed that you do the work that you're there. Well, we've had that issue in other cities before of uh, council people not being there, but they didn't uh, get their paychecks prorated. I don't think I think they still took that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but so you're part of a council that seems to. Be comfortable with, oh, legislating or at least uh, making resolutions on things that they'll never have to face as a city. Yes, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you. I'll give. I'll. I'll give you a great example of that. Okay. Uh, so, uh, 
back when the United States, when our, the, the Trump administration was looking at uh, the Paris Climate Accord and how, how it would impact the United States and what kind of what kind of potential it had to really solve uh, global climate change, um, they decided that it wasn't a good deal for the United States. And it had never been ratified, as you know, by our, by our Congress or by the Senate because they knew it wouldn't. Name, name a climate treaty that has. That's what I always say. Right. Kyoto, uh, name any of them. Yeah. None of them have been, ever been ratified. No. Right. And, and so, so what happened is this. Uh, the president was looking at, at getting out of it, and so uh, there was a, a, a con- mayor conference of mayors, and I think mm-hmm. it, the subject was brought up that, that cities should, should adopt resolutions in support of the Paris Climate Accord. And so I saw this coming at our city, reading through the packet, you know, oh, here it comes, you know, we're going to pass a resolution to support the Paris Climate Accord. And I said, so I, I, I did a lot what, of... What's, what's your thinking when you get that packet? I mean, you got you to, gotta like, cheer yourself up by putting on, like, Nightmare on Elm Street or something like that? I mean, what... Yeah, sometimes it is, sometimes I cringe when I, when I open the packet. And, it's, yeah. like, it's like a letter uh, from the IRS. <laughs> Good news. Yeah. <laughs> You've been selected. Yeah. You got a jury summons. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to think of what could be worse than the packets he's opening. Oh, yeah, cool. and there, there are two to 300 pages, and we get them on Friday afternoon, yeah. and we have a council meeting on Tuesday. So, you know, take all the time you want to prepare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So anyway, so so I I started studying the uh, Paris Climate Accord. I printed it out. I started reading it and studying all the background on it. And uh, you know, from my from everything I had heard and read on it, and and actually reading it, it did not look like a good deal for the United States. And that's precisely why why uh, President Obama never brought it to Congress because he knew it wouldn't pass. Even the Democrats wouldn't pass it. And since that time, I've been informed that. Uh, there's been studies of the Paris Climate Accord, and they said that if every city that was, or every country rather, that was part of the Paris Climate Accord that signed on to it, did everything that was in the the accord and complied with everything perfectly, it may possibly reduce the increase in temperature of the Earth over eighty over an 82 year period by one sixth of one degree centigrade. Hey, that sounds worth it to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, you know, we, we've we, we've uh, we've seen all Al Gore's predictions come true, right? Yeah, I mean, he the sky said, is falling. Yeah, yes. he said, you know, Antarctica could be floating by Florida or something. Well, right now. when you have the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency putting out articles about how climate change is causing all the hurricanes because we deal with them so much here in Minnesota. <laughs> I, well, I mean, it, it's it's, it's uh, the, the climate is always changing. I mean, yes. this, I don't want to get into a global warming no. debate here, but I mean, you know, I've always challenged whether you know is me driving to work. Now, think about this for a second. Yeah, I know I'm getting off subject, but I got to throw this out here. Think of how much better we are at everything, from how much better our cars are to how much better and more fuel efficient our energy is. Uh, you name it, and we are better at it than we were five yeah. years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. Constant improvement. It's always – technology is the one thing you can't hold back. Right. You can't stop innovation. No, until the robots kill us. <laughs> that's how it's going to go. AI will do, yeah. will do us in. But yeah. all, these, all these private sector inventions that have come by, and I know some of them are subsidized occasionally by – government too but but you know all of these things to to better ourselves and improve our quality of life why doesn't anybody look at that and say okay wait a minute the temperature was allegedly not rising back in the 50s and 60s but we had way less fuel efficient right trains and cars and planes i mean aviation was just getting into major we have excellent technology now right how do you draw the conclusion between the two I don't know, and I would say we probably had more manufacturing back then no, too. We so we were burning a lot more coal, and 
Well, I don't know if you guys remember this or not, but back in the 70s, Time Magazine on the... I I don't know about that, but I read history. (laughs) (laughs) On the cover of the Time Magazine... Oh, the Ice Age, right? They said that the Ice Age is imminent, that it is coming, (laughs) that the the ice, the earth is going to cool and it's going to freeze and it's going to be catastrophic. Mm. So, you know, I, I guess you're right. I don't want to debate, you know, global yeah. climate change because the global, the, the global climate does change. And, you know, what, what you want to attribute the cause to, I really don't care. I don't think it matters. I think, I mean, I'm very much a Christian. I think God put us on this earth. He gave us dominion over the earth. He said, take care of the earth. It's, you know, you're entrusted with the care and, and feeding of the earth. And so I think it's our responsibility to do absolutely everything we can to be good stewards of the earth and our environment for not only for us living today, but for our children, our grandchildren and, and generations beyond. Yes. I want clean air. I want clean water. Absolutely. I I think it is up to us to be good stewards. I've also read the end of that book and it isn't us who ruins the earth. (laughs) <laughs> just say it <laughs> exactly if, if that's your worldview Wh- which book are you talking uh, about the, the bible oh yeah. okay. revelations yes, yes. But, <laughs> but, but you re- you remember last time when we talked about uh uh oh, we had so many rainy days in a row yes and i asked you what book noah's yeah. ark was in and yeah. i re- i didn't realize it was in the beginning yes it genesis. Was. See, yes. see to me genesis is a band with phil collins in it yeah. so i mean you know no i'm i'm joe i digress here but i mean you know the 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 whole thing about um you know again how it it is or not the, the the president and the Congress and everybody else has got a responsibility first and foremost to our Constitution, mm-hmm. and, absolutely, and not to aiding the rest of the world or whatever or whatever is in that. I've read some of it. I don't want to read any more of it, uh, you know, as far as that's concerned about about the thing. But but again, the role of local government. Okay, mm-hmm. we we talk about public safety. We talk about roads. We talk about parks. Uh, we talk about. Uh, Sewer and water, and 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 again, it's another issue where your council's just way off track, right? And so, you know, my opponent says, "Well, you know, we're not an island. The city of Eden Prairie is not an island, and we need to be aware of what's going on in the world, and we need to do everything." And you know, that's fine. I mean, I would like world peace. I think world peace is is so important, and I think starvation and you know, and feeding people is really important, but. If we focus on those things at a city level, we will not stay focused on the things that we're elected to do and, and our services will suffer and people in, in our city will not be well served. And so I think we really need to stay focused on the issues that we're elected to, to maintain, just like you mentioned, police, fire, sewer, water, parks, community centers, streets, you know, snow maintenance, if we don't plow the streets because we're off, you know, worrying about, uh, you know, global climate change and the Paris Accord and gun control and all these issues that, that frankly, that the city has no control over, that has no, no authority over, we lose focus. We're spending taxpayer money on things that, that we're not elected to do. Right. Well, and, and you look at something like that. I mean, it, it takes a lot of scientific knowledge or – or willful ignorance by scientists, depending on how you feel about it, to come up with conclusions about that. Uh, presidents and and senators and and U.S. House uh, members they have they have staff members they have access to think tanks they have access to to uh, all these resources and people on city councils. No offense, don't have access to those same resources. <laughs> it's what feels good or what, what are the special interests saying that are pushing a political or, point or worse? What is the city over here doing? The city over here doing, we yeah. got to copy what they're Th- doing. There's that too. Yeah. yeah. There's a little bit of that going, but you know, I think Eden Prairie has done an, an exemplary job in maintaining our city and, and really conserving energy and being good stewards of our environment. For example, we had we started a program, um, you know, under my leadership as well. To it was called the twenty forty fifteen program. So what that stood for is that we would we would uh, reduce our energy consumption at all of our facilities by twenty percent. We would reduce our fuel, or we would increase our fuel economy of our fleet 
by 40% all by the year 2015. Well, we exceeded all those goals, and the good result of that is that we saved um, our residents over $246,000 a year in fuel. We saved $776,000 in energy costs over a 10-year period. So, you know, it was... it There's, was, there's pluses to being fuel right. efficient, good... Uh, good stewards of the econ- of the environment and so on and so forth. We all need to do what you're talking about. Right. And I, and I advocated for that. And I was a, I was a very strong believer in that program because it saved money. It made sense. It makes the city a good example for, for our residents and our businesses. Now we have a program that's called sustainable Eden Prairie, where we're just taking those steps to the next level and, and doing more to conserve and, and everything. And so I've championed programs that really help the environment, but they're, they're real programs. They're, they, that can achieve measurable results that you can measure with metrics. In the city you were elected to do it in. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. But it's not it's not global warming. Yeah. Not global climate change. It's it's doing what we can in our own city. And I you know, I want to bring our city with innovative, you know, uh things to do that with. And I, I'm you know, I have a technology background. Like I said, electrical engineer. I, I look at the technology. I, I'm aware of those things. And so I'm using that technology to make sure that Eden Prairie is is doing the right things and moving moving things forward for our residents. Could you talk a little bit more about just some of the things that you have done over over the tenure of your service that that have contributed to making Eden Prairie better. It, it, Go ahead and brag on yourself just for a little bit, I guess. Hey, it's, hey, hey remember, <laughs> yeah. Muhammad Ali once said, if it's a fact, you ain't bragging. That's true. <laughs> so That's true. Not- <laughs> thank, thank you. I appreciate that. So I'll give you a couple examples. So, you know, I think it's good to talk about things, but I think I'd rather do things than talk about things. And, and I, unfortunately, because I don't talk about a lot of these things, uh, people don't maybe know about them, and so they don't know what I've done. So here's, here's an example of that regarding environmental issues. When I was elected to the city council in 2004, Round Lake, one of our s- central lakes in Eden Prairie. I've played softball by there. Yeah, we have very nice very fields, nice field. very nice fields. But the lake itself was no longer swimmable. The reason for that was because it was polluted with runoff and and geese feces and other issues, and so it couldn't be used as swimming anymore. And that was really a nice facility for families with young kids to come and swim there, and it was just centrally located, a great place. So I said, look, we've got to do something about this. So I didn't, you know broadcast it out that I was doing this, but I met with the watershed districts. I met with our residents. I worked with our staff. We really dug into the issue and said, why is the water quality bad? What can we do to fix it? And so we actually worked with uh, quite a number of groups and it took, it took like two years, but now it's open for swimming again. And it has been uh, since I think 2006 or 2007. I don't remember the exact year. Mm-hmm. I've got a picture of me standing in the in the, in the lake when it when it <laughs> when we opened the swimming beach. Oh, nice. And so so that's kind of an example of not just talking about feel good, you know, uh, global climate change, but actually doing something concrete, measurable, making a difference. That's one example. The other example I would say is in regard to uh, to taxes and spending. When I got on the council, uh, our taxes had gone up in the previous number of years by over 7% a year. When I got on the council, I said, this is not sustainable growth of our budget. If we do this in 10 years, the rule of seven says we will double our budget. Our city cannot afford to do that. So with a lot of uh, a lot of weeping and gnashing of teeth by the other council members, <laughs> I I, uh, I really beat this in, and we were able to turn our budget around, and we actually had uh, three years of zero percent uh, uh, levy growth, and that was wow. during the recessionary times. Wow, that's really good. Hmm. And now my opponent wants to tout that as one of his achievements with that he achieved with me, even though I, I fought him tooth and nail through, throughout the process. That's usually the way it goes, though, Andrew, isn't yeah, it? I mean, well, you've got to love, uh, 
you gotta love people who agree with you when they're running against you. <laughs> yeah. Remember the old remember the old saying about Washington, you don't want everybody to praise you. Right. You'll end up being Merrick Garland. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> don't want that. <laughs> Oh. So, uh, so I'll give you another, some other couple of examples. Yeah, keep that, bragging. Yeah, keep bragging. These are these are <laughs> things that are completely different. So, a different topic. So, transportation is one of my key areas that I really like to focus on because I feel that it it impacts quality of life for our residents. It impacts the ability of businesses to want to be located in our in our community. Yeah. If they don't have good transportation, they can't get their their workers to and from the job. They can't. Uh, pass goods and services through to the community, and it's bad. So we really need to focus on transportation. So since I've been on the council, I've been on the I-494 Corridor Commission. That's a five-city or uh, joint powers agreement uh, organization. And our commission, along with uh, l- lots of legislators, I, I've been to the I've been to the state legislature many many times, advocating on behalf of of our of our issues talking before the Senate and the House transportation committees, the transportation finance committees. I've met numerous times with our, our uh, MnDOT commissioner, uh, Charlie Zelli, and others. And so one of the things as a result of that, when I got on the council, I said, if, if during my tenure on the council, I can affect some change that would get 494-169 interchange redone, get rid of the three sets of lights that are there, and get that interchange done, I will feel like I accomplished something. Guess what? We got it done. Hmm. And it wasn't just us, but you know, I can't take all the credit for that. But if it wouldn't have been for our group and us pushing it, it wouldn't have happened. Wow. Now, this year, we got MnDOT to agree to do the phase one of 494-35W interchange. Hmm. That interchange was built the year I was born, in 1959. Hmm. Design. Hey. Don't do the math. No, I'm not. <laughs> but you know what happened in 1959? No. My Dodgers won the World Series. I knew. Some was that long ago? Was coming. Four to two <laughs> over the Chicago White Sox, their second year in Los Angeles. Hmm. Wow, that's a bit of trivia. I can name them all. I, I am a fountain of worthless information. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> or something. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> but anyway, it, that, it, that, it was designed for two, a maximum capacity of 200,000 vehicles a day. Uh, it currently sees up to 400,000 vehicles a day. Yeah. 17th worst uh, intersection in the United States. Busiest interchange in the state of Minnesota. It's bad. You know, uh, all my years of working at Best Buy, yeah. I can look out the window and see it at noon. That <laughs> it's bad. So it's bad all yeah. times during the day. Noon yes. on Sunday, and it's bad. There was never a good time yeah. for that interchange. No. Maybe four a.m. or something. That's about it. But, Go to work five hours early. <laughs> however, all that being said, MnDOT did not have it on their on their plans to redo that, even on their twenty five year projected plans. Wow. So I said, look, we have got to push that. So I, got, I talked to all of our legislators. It, then you started seeing it appear on the news. Our legislators were talking about it. MnDOT started talking about it. We have a MnDOT representative that comes to every one of our 494 Corridor Commission meetings. We talked to them extensively about it. And guess what? This year they decided to do Phase 1, and that's going to be done in 2021. But even better than that, mm. you know how bad 494 is in the Bloomington Strip in that whole area? Yes. It's not in Eden Prairie, but I still advocate for it because it impacts residents in Eden Prairie, well, businesses sure in Eden Prairie. Yeah. But it's really a, a regional It's a regional impact. So MnDOT agreed to add a lane, an additional lane between 490, on 494, both directions between Highway 77 to the east yeah. And France Avenue to the west. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. So look at, I mean, that is going to be huge. That will be huge. Yeah, it always bogs down from like about Highway 100 east uh, yeah. all the way over to about 77. Not it's, looking forward yeah. to the construction, but I agree. I right. mean, yeah, you guys will all be cursing <laughs> but, me when they're but, constructing. <laughs> but it, it will run smoother. It will run smoother because, yeah. you know, I have a deal with Jeff Johnson. Yeah. 
that if he wins, I get to be the MnDOT commissioner. Right. So we're, we're not going to shut down 35E, 35W, 494, 169, 100, all at the same time like we do now. Why would, why would we not want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I understand road rage better than I ever have the last couple of years, I can tell you that. Yeah. So. Uh, I'll I'll make sure that the other things aren't being done at the same time when I'm when I'm commissioner. That's good. Look at all these look at all these goals that. I see. How goal oriented I am. That, that's good. All these things I want to do. Yeah. I'll never do any of them, but I'm just saying. I mean, they, you know, <laughs> but I they have, are they are they are. I have those goals. They're important goals. <laughs> you, you never set a goal, you'll never reach it. That's. They're hey, admirable. Goal goals, without so. a plan is a wish. I think Dr. Phil said that. Yeah. <laughs> a goal without a plan is. Oh, I won't do. I won't do impersonations on this one. All right. All right. Um, we interrupted your bragging. Keep bragging. What? Well, what <laughs> or are you? I mean, those are story? those are yeah. just a couple of good examples. You know, from different different areas, different things that I've you know been focused on, and I also I chair the 494 corridor or the uh, the Flying Cloud Airport. Joint Airport Zoning Board. We're looking at zoning the land around the Flying Cloud Airport so we can bring more businesses into the, into the city. Working with MnDOT on that um, and Mac on that. I, I am also. Oh boy. Ch- yeah, it's scary. Oh but no, they're, we're 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 getting along. We're doing a good job. And I also right. chair the Southwest Transit Organization, which is our opt-out bus service that provides fabulous service. It's an award-winning service. Provides uh, great transportation uh, for our residents in Eden Prairie and west of Eden Prairie. Even Joe Sushri brags about that. Yeah. On Garage Logic. Wow. You got Joe Sushri on board. Well, good. Yeah. He should be because everyone that takes it, I mean, we have like a 98, we've, we survey our, our riders, we have like a 98% you know, uh, approval rating. Everyone loves the service. It is phenomenal. You can, you can get on a bus in Eden Prairie at Southwest Village Station. You can be downtown in 18 to 22 minutes roughly because the bus has an advantage because it can use the shoulders and it can also use the HOV lanes. Right. And so... The reason people take the bus is because there is a time advantage. So if they can get downtown in 18 to 22 minutes, they can ride on a coach bus where they have free Wi-Fi. They can relax. They don't have to pay to park when they get downtown. The bus can drop them off at a number of different stops, unlike Southwest LRT, potentially. (laughs) And and, and they can get downtown uh, quickly. And so they love the service. They absolutely love it. Well, it's got to be better than that. See, from Hiawatha, you can get from the Mall of America downtown in like two hours. Yeah. That's, <laughs> you know? That's, that's efficient. Yeah. yeah, that is. Oh, you you know it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, what was it? With the with the uh, blue line up Botno, it was going to take a lot longer as well to take the rail than it would be the rapid or the, the express buses that are currently the, going the, out of the well, 63rd Well, yeah, but, but bus rapid transit, the right. way it's envisioned, is not there yet. Right. But but you think about, I believe it was uh, to the from the Target Field interchange to the Target in Brooklyn Park was something like 47 minutes. Yeah, wow. And the express bus, which was half the price, we get there in half the time. Because yeah. you said, they, they like Brad said, they can... Uh, they would have their own express lane like they do out in the gateway. Right. So it wouldn't, um, it wouldn't be, um, uh, it would be an express downtown, not a stopping every right. five feet kind of thing. Um, just briefly, I know. We, I don't you know, want to talk about that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I know we're getting a little short on time, but what, speaking of Southwest, I mean, how has that battle gone and, and how do you see that going forward, especially with you as a mayor? So really, as a city, we don't have any control at all over Southwest LRT, whether yeah. it comes or not. And so my commitment is this, and it's always been this, and, and that is if it comes, if the project comes to Eden Prairie, I will do everything in my power to make sure that it's as, as successful as possible and that will it'll disrupt our current traffic systems as little as possible. And that also that it will fit in from a, you know, from a community look and feel the, you know, the stations won't be uh, as drab and plain as they are in some of the areas that we'll have (laughs) what the, what the city calls lurkies and lurkies Uh. are, are local. Basically they stand, stands for local improvements. So we can, we can upgrade some of the look and feel of the stations if we use some local money to do that. And so 
I think we want to do that uh, to make it fit in better to our community. And so I'm committed to doing that and making it as sex- successful as possible. Well, that's all you can do, yeah, really. There's I not mean, much if something gets imposed on you like that. Because the county more. wants to do it, just like they do with Botno. They want to do it. And thank goodness with Botno, the railway won't let them use the tracks. They're stuck. <laughs> but with Southwest, I know they've been fighting further with, along you know, than whether to tunnel under the lake or, you know, all of that stuff. And so there's some complications but that may me, or where, may not come. Where does it stand right now? So, yeah. so here's a, a brief uh, summary of where it stands right now. Um, they, they have the local money identified. But that's approximately half of the two plus billion dollars, and it's going to be more than that. Oh, it when always it's, is. Okay. I, I've been I've been saying for eight six eight years that it's going to be two billion, and everyone said no, no, no. It's capped at one point six three. It's oh, we we had to raise it to this, and now it's over two billion. But guess what? That that doesn't include all of the right of way costs that I think they vastly underestimated the cost to purchase that. They also always underestimate future capital costs. That's always yeah. underestimated. Future capital costs, and just look at what's happened in the last year, year and a half. We had we had a number of of terrible um, events uh, from a from a global climate uh, uh, perspective, where we had hurricanes and hit 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 the United States. And so, guess what? There's a lot of resources that went down there in terms of reconstruction and in terms of construction material costs. You know, when you have that much construction material costs going to those areas that were impacted and you have the construction teams going there to do the construction, right. guess what's going to happen to construction costs? They're going up. Right. Oh, yeah. You've got more demand and less supply. Yeah. See, that's economics for all you people listening in San Francisco. Just so you know that. You know. So anyway, so where so where it stands is this: there's still there's still a, an outstanding lawsuit that has to be resolved, and the 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 real big thing that I look at is that um, we haven't fully get been given Minnesota hasn't been fully given the federal full funding grant agreement, the FFGA. That grant agreement is basically half of the project or $993 million. It's a significant amount well, of money. The, I know that Congress and the Trump administration have slowed down a lot of the yeah. free free money coming from the feds. And I think uh, – the pro- I, mean, I mean, I know there was the hubbub about – the legislature not funding it, the County Transit Improvement Board CTIB, yep. dissolving and putting on the tax anyway and, and uh, ponying up more money or whatever that – I'm trying to remember the details. But, I could give you all the inside uh, scoop, but that would take way too long yeah. and it's too much in the weeds. But, yeah. but here's the, 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 tra- the Federal Transit Administration, the FTA, released a statement this spring that said they are not going to provide funding for any project, any rail project that has not already been awarded the grant or the full funding grant agreements. They wow. specifically listed – the Botno, Botno uh, Boulevard line, and they listed Southwest LRT. Now, that doesn't prevent Congress from going around the administration and awarding the money anyway. So They can earmark it. They yeah. can earmark yeah. it and do it themselves. So that's kind of where we're at right now is we're, we're waiting to see if they get, they get that money. Wow. Mm. Well, well, we'll be yeah. following that one for sure. <laughs> that. Anything else that you want to hit that we missed? Um, did we cover everything sufficiently? Well, I think I think we covered a lot of topics, um, and it was good to get a good mix. I appreciate it very much having the opportunity to do this. I guess the thing that I would just like to say is that as a as a mayoral candidate, as a as a mayor, my goal is really to focus on the key things that we are elected to office to do at a city at the local level. It is a nonpartisan position, and the reason for that is because we're there just to do the good things that the city needs done. 
and we need to keep the city moving forward. I want to keep Eden Prairie a number one city destination, and I, I believe I can do that. I have the vision to do that, and I can do it in a way that's uh, economically feasible and, um, and conservative in terms of economics, not raising our taxes too much to fund all kinds of projects that we don't need, but fund the projects that we do and invest in things like our parks and our community centers, the things that make Eden Prairie an attractive community that makes people want to come. The other thing we really, I think, need to focus on that we haven't done enough with is our business community. We are blessed in Eden Prairie to have over 3,400 businesses. We have a lot of large businesses that employ a lot of people. The great thing about having businesses located in your city is that it provides great jobs for your residents so they can spend less time on the road commuting, sitting on 494, waiting for the 35W <laughs> interchange to free up, right. and they can spend more time with their families, which is the most important thing to me is to have people spend time with their families. And so I am focused on those issues to make sure that we keep businesses here in Eden Prairie. The other thing that they do is is that businesses pay a lot of property taxes. And when they do, guess what? That means our residents pay much less in property taxes. And so it's a it's really a double win to have businesses located in your community. So as a as a city as a mayor what I would like to do is really spend more time with our our top employers in Eden Prairie, set up quarterly meetings between the city staff and myself and go to those those businesses and say, look, what's going on in your world? Are you guys hiring? You know, what is your forecast? What do you what what is the next you know six months what year one year look like? What do you think? Do you need you know do you need more employees? Are you what are what are the issues that you're experiencing? How can we help? We value you being here in our community. We want to help you. We want to keep you here. How can we how can we help you? And I think businesses would really appreciate that, and I think we'd have a lot better um, chances of business retention, which I think is so critical. Wow, that's good. So say somebody wants to read up on you or ask for a lawn sign or help hand out lit or maybe give you money. Let, let them know how to do that. Well, there's, there's a lot of different ways. I have a Facebook page, Brad Ajo for Mayor. I have a website, bradajo.com. You can send me email, bradajo at bradajo.com. Uh, if you go to my website, my home phone number is listed, my address, home address is listed. You can send me, send me a check, uh, uh, whatever you want to do. And if you just have questions, I'd love to, uh, to help you out and answer your questions. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I'm on the website now. And, yeah, there's, uh, there's directions right there on the website under the Donate tab if that's what you want to do. I'm sure you do – Need some volunteer help as well, and more lawn sign locations would be great. I would love to get more lawn sign lo locations right now. We're still putting them out, and uh, donations would certainly help because Eden Prairie has about 65,000 residents. We have about 25,000 households, and so it's a and it's uh, 36 square miles, six miles by six miles. So there's a I've been pounding the pavement and, and door knocking. That's what I did right before coming here tonight. I was out door knocking. And, you know, that's important because you get to talk to the residents and they tell you the issues that are important to them in their neighborhood. And that's what's so critical about, about door knocking. And Like I've said, and I've said this a million times, yeah, I would give anything if everybody could run for office one time and spend a whole summer and fall door knocking and talking to people. You will never get a greater education. than When I did that personally, and I'm sure you'd agree, Brad, you will never get you'll, – you'll never get more rewarding. The positives by far outweigh the negatives, talking to folks and just having conversations and getting to know what they're thinking. And you'll learn more by knocking on doors, I think, than anything else. I totally agree. And when you're standing at their door, at their house, when they're on the inside and feeling comfortable, you're standing on the stoop, out on the step, on the front porch. They're comfortable. It's a comfortable you know, uh, environment for them. They're happy to ask you questions that they would never think to come to the city council and bring those questions up. But when you're standing there, That's right. people gonna... are the most honest when they're at their own door. Yes, they <laughs> absolutely. It can and be I... intimidating for people to come to a council meeting, I think, sometimes. It is. And I know it... I was. I'm not anymore. But, you know, actually, I think the most frightened I was was in front of the legislature. No, right? Now they try to intimidate you when you show up to the council <laughs> yeah, meeting. Yeah. They see you coming <laughs> yeah <laughs> there's all this 
on a walkie-talkie. You know, <laughs> you know <I'm> not. <laughs> no, but it is super rewarding to do that without a doubt. I agree. It's it's really fun, and I you know I I enjoy people. I love Eden Prairie. I just you know I'm very passionate about keeping it a great city and and really using the city, my city, my position at the city to keep the city a great city and not use it as a political platform to broadcast my own personal views or or personal uh, agenda. I think that is so wrong, and that's what that's the thing that most. Uh, is troubling about my opponent's uh, views is he wants to use the city as his platform to broadcast his agenda. And I think, you know, all the residents don't feel that way. They don't agree with them. And why should we allow that to happen? We need to use the city as what it's designed for, serve the residents. Yeah, I agree. You know, enough of these grandstanding measures and, and just need to be about the business of the city. Absolutely. Wow. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Brad. It was great to have you on the show. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity. It's nice to get to meet you guys, and uh, and I, I so much uh, thank you for all that you do and, and spreading the good word. Well, thank you. You'll have to let us know how, uh, yeah, how everything good luck turns to out. You. Good luck. Yeah. November 6th, we'll know. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I got, I got, I got till then to keep spreading the word. Well, we're, we'll help you as much as we can here. So thank you. All right. Take thank care. you. Well, what a I, show. I'm, I'm kind of speechless. I Eden mean, Prairie and Crystal all mud muddled together there. Yeah. Uh, a very fun show. Brad was terrific. Absolutely. Certainly better than my rant at the beginning of the show there. <laughs> it's all right. It was a little long, but uh, a little long. But, but it know. was entertaining. I think we needed to tell that story in full because I, in no way, shape, or form, want Julia Hill to win. Um, just who she's connected with and it willingly is, is bad enough. Not to mention her character. It, I'm, I'm well, not pleased and, with and, either. And the partisanship. I mean, yeah. don't give me this crap. You're going to listen to people. Put people first. If you come in and try and Im- impose mm-hmm. your ideology, then you're not doing that. Yeah, and, and contrast that, you know, with with Brad who comes in here and you know, he's definitely got opinions, but he's not one that's going to just sit and slam people that disagree with him. He's going to try and find the common points where he where people the, connect. He, he didn't do that at all. No. He didn't slam people whatsoever. Even when talking about his opponent, it was very respectful. I thought so. That's how much. you do this. I mean, that's how you win at this kind of thing. It's not it's not by treating people with all these well, levels of disrespect like well, that. it's it's there's there's the people who do that you know i you know i'm sure people who don't like us will say we do the same thing i mean that's just right you know, it gives me a good laugh but <laughs> what can you do absolutely but you know you know i tell you what we can do yeah. you know what we can do what if people want to go off like at the beginning of the show we have a microphone right here that'll get it to way more people than they ever yep. will in fact, uh, on his way out the door, as I as I was uh, escorting him out, uh, this will be for a future time. But he he broke a little bit of news to me. Uh-oh. Uh oh. At the last work session or workshop that they had in Eden Prairie, they started talking about Tobacco Twenty One, which we've railed against here on this program. So we'll have more on that coming up. But uh, yeah, I, I, I'm going to throw out a warning here. Yep. Look out for the lame duck period then. Yeah. Look out for the you know the time in November and December for somebody to get snuck in like yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, he did mention that uh, Mayor Nancy Tyra Lukens would like to get this taken care of before she's gone in January. So, hmm. so keep a watch on that because as we've said on this program, it's bad for business and it's just a bad law when, when it gets uh, enacted because all you got to do is go over – one city and buy your tobacco and you can come back and smoke it. That's not against the law. You're just hurting business is all you're doing. So I don't I understand the. I, I don't get it. I mean, smoking yeah. is not good for you, but it's a, it's a freedom issue. I mean, yeah. it's kind of like liquor stores being open on a Sunday. I mean, I, I, I don't get the argument right. that they shouldn't be right. And how that took forever. To, thank God it did. Cause I'm so right. sick of talking about it, but the point is, is what is it? What rationale was yeah. there for that to continue? Yeah, uh, there's none. You know, and and think about it. Uh, 
Brad said that Eden Prairie is six miles by six miles. So even if you live in the smack dab center where you are the furthest away from any border, it is still only a three-mile drive to get to Bloomington or Savage or uh, Chanhassen or, you know, it. Just well, go buy them three miles. Have somebody else buy them. For I've you. walked three these, miles. These people it's... are addicted to a drug. Yeah. They're going to get it somehow. Yeah. That's what's, you know, you heard of an alcoholic. They're going to get their alcohol one way or another. Yeah. Somebody's on drugs. And I, I don't mean to compare it to cocaine or something, but, you know, if you, if you have an addiction, um, you know that addiction can take over your life in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. If somebody wants to smoke. What, what's the difference if they're twenty or twenty-one? I mean, I go back to this, Jay, and and again, I'm not going to go on too long about this, but it's time as a country and as a society, as a state, whatever you want to call it, we need to pick one age. Yeah, where somebody's an adult or not. Yep. I mean, I am scratching my head. How a 14-year-old kid in the state of Minnesota who cannot drive, cannot work, cannot vote, cannot smoke, cannot drink, cannot serve in the military, bubble, new, Get a hotel gamble, room, rent a car, rent a car um, cannot take a Tylenol at school without a parent's permission, can be tried as an adult if they are accused of a crime. Now, you tell me where in the law that makes a modicum of... I'm not saying send the 14-year-old to bed with no dinner. That's not what I'm advocating. But if they're not mature enough, you know, if a 20-year-old's not mature enough to decide to smoke or not, what else are they not mature enough to do? Yeah. Where do you stop that? Exactly. They've talked about gun sales, putting that up to 21. I mean... Why, why can't funny we pick... you can't buy a gun, but you can get one issued to you yes. as you put on your fatigues and head out to war? Absolutely. Police <laughs> academies, too. I mean, maybe I don't know if you have to be 21 to join the academy, but um, yeah, you can you can use a weapon. Uh, you can bomb somebody from 30,000 feet, yeah. but you cannot get a cash, a, a carry permit that's what they want to make them. i mean but it, it just it, it brings the issue up of when are you an adult and when aren't you and to me the constitution applies to everybody uh we can't make obviously children are children and, and the constitution does lay that out yeah you know so but if somebody can vote how can they be banned from using things it just i i it, it's time to pick one age i don't know what the hell that age should be um you know, that's a different debate, but uh, we need to pick one age where somebody's an adult or not. Yeah, so I agree. Well, maybe with you want to... With that, yeah. we've talked enough. <laughs> maybe, Close her out, Jay. Maybe you want to help make decisions like that and, and decide what an adult is, what an adult isn't. And to do that, you need to get involved. You need to serve on an advisory commission. You need to get on a city council, county commission, a school board. We can help you with that. I mean, granted... Election season's wrapping up. It's too late for you to get elected if you're not on the ballot already. And I'm not talking about putting together a write-in campaign with two weeks left. That's just dumb. Get on an, get on an advisory commission and start making a difference. I mean, it, if Tobacco 21 is of interest to you, get on a human rights commission. If if guns are your thing, you know, sometimes it's, it's uh, the planning commission that takes that up. If it's a zoning law, it could be the human rights commission that takes that up. If it's more of uh, an ownership issue, it doesn't matter. You, you need to get involved, and we can help you with that. Uh, one way is we, we supply all of this free information every week, blogs and podcasts. And, you know, uh, another way is to have us come out and speak to you. Uh, we would love to do that. Share this stuff because that – is knowledge power, you know, and we want to get this knowledge into as many hands as possible because that's how we start to, to turn the tide. So this is all about us stepping, you know, to the, to the plate, doing our research, coming to you every week with the best in information. And then it's about you taking that information. We're handing the baton to you like a relay race and you take that baton and you run with it and you even better like the baton that's on fire and you know, they tie it to the fox's tail and the fox runs and sets the fields on fire. That's what you guys are supposed to do. 
take that baton that's on fire, run with it through the fields, set them on fire. Not not literally, but you, you got my draft. Because we need to make this happen quickly. And so let's compress the time frame. Let, let's work on this together. You can email us with anything going on in your city. C-O-M-M solutions, M-N at gmail.com. That's C-O-M-M solutions, M-N at gmail.com. And we'd love to talk to you about it or help you out with, with whatever's going on. Just let us know. Cause we've done our part, Minnesota. We have, we've, we've gathered our part of the argument. We've submitted it for your review. Now we love you. And it's your turn. I get too caught